Treble winning manager Hansi Flick is currently being linked to a number of clubs in Europe. And since I'm on a roll covering German managers, today I'm doing a deep dive into the tactics and play style of Hansi Flick. At the end of the video, I'll also have a section on whether he's a good fit for the Barcelona job specifically, since a lot of you Barca fans have been very vocal asking for this one, but the majority will be relevant for whichever club actually signs him. So do consider leaving a like if you enjoy the video, and let's get into it. Hansi Flick, despite his reputation, doesn't actually have a lot of experience as a head coach. At the start of his career, he spent five years at Hoffenheim in the fourth and third tiers of German football, but the majority of his time at the top has been as an assistant coach of RB Salzburg, Germany and Bayern Munich. Then when Niko Kovac was sacked, he took over the Bayern job 10 league games into the 1920 season with Bayern in fourth place and he went on to win absolutely everything. A continental treble, plus the German Super Cup, UEFA Super Cup and Club World Cup. However, he was only at Bayern for one year afterwards, making the 2021 season to this day Hansi Flick's only full season as a head coach in a top domestic league. Regardless, Flick left Bayern with an 83% win rate, one of the highest in history. Unfortunately, Flick's success at Bayern was heavily contrasted with his time at Germany. Over 25 matches, Flick had a win rate of just 48%, and his points per game of 1.72 is the second worst in German national team history. So in terms of analysing Flick the coach, it's going to be quite difficult to draw any definitive conclusions. We have less than two full seasons as a domestic coach, and just a short tenure with the national team. However, having gone back and watched a lot of games, I did find a general methodology behind Flick's teams, so I'm going to explain what that is using his magnum opus, Bayern Munich 2019-20. You know, contrary to popular belief, I don't spend all my time watching football. It's about 99% of my time. The rest is spent eating, sleeping, and watching movies on Netflix. But did you know Netflix are lying to us? And also these other services? That's because when you search for a film, you're not actually seeing the full library of content. Thousands of titles are restricted based on your location. Here in the UK, I can't watch Lord of the Rings. That was until I started using ExpressVPN the sponsor of today's video. Now all I have to do is go online, look up which location the film is available, and with the click of a button, ExpressVPN will take me there. So you guys in Norway can finally watch Ronaldo vs Messi face off. And let's say I don't want to pay for an expensive subscription to watch certain games, <coughs> Champions League. Just hop on over to Ireland and start watching for free. So just head to expressvpn.com forward slash TPF to get three months of ExpressVPN completely free. Give it a go. In short, Hansi Flick made Bayern a relentless, high-intensity monster. And the game plan was essentially this, to arrive in the opponent's box as often as possible with as many players as possible. And to do that, Flick was happy to take a lot of risks on and off the ball. The basic shape was usually 4-2-3-1, but as you can see, it's far from rigid with a very mobile double pivot, with Muller and Lewandowski interchanging, wingers drifting inside. But an important feature is the width of this back four, both fullbacks would hug the touchline in every phase of the game, and that was key in Bayern's progression, stretching the midfield to create central passing lanes into the forwards. Or, if the opponent stayed compact, you create a wide passing lane for the fullback. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is because it shows Flick's emphasis on breaking the midfield line as quickly as possible so the forwards could see a lot of the ball. And probably the most interesting part of this team was the freedom that those forwards had. It was mainly centred around Lewandowski, who at this point was pretty fantastic with his link-up, but whether it was Gnabry drifting inside, or Goretzka pushing up between the lines, or Muller running all over the place, there was a lot of licence to float around, create angles, or run in behind. It was very dynamic and actually very vertical. Once a player had space, they didn't think twice about trying to find those runs, which were often very well coordinated. And the success of this system shows in the numbers. Since 2017, Bayern 1920 are second in European leagues for both progressive passes and passes into the penalty area. This was a team that applied a lot of pressure in the final third. So it seems like the messaging from Flick was uncomplicated and based on a few important principles. Open up the pitch, be very dynamic off the ball, and be forward thinking on it. And because they created space so effectively and they had such quality attacking players, Bayern were able to score, on average, over three goals a game. Now, I do want to focus on one element of this team specifically, and that's their verticality. Because in 1920, Flick's Bayern made the most long passes of any team in the Bundesliga, with 92.6 long passes per 90. 
And in the modern game, it's quite rare for a top team to be anywhere near that number. This is Flix Bayern compared to last year's league champions. Part of the reason for that is that this team didn't really have any consistent build-up patterns. They were very good at creating space against mid blocks because of the mobility of the pivots. Thiago would often drop to free himself from pressure and take advantage of the movement ahead of him. But against the most aggressive teams, Bayern were happy to bypass those pivots completely. And actually, that ended up being one of their best routes to goal just because of how primed they were to chase those long passes. But the main reason I'm bringing this up is because of something we've talked about over the past few videos, and that is if you want to be defensively proactive, more verticality generally means more running. That's because when the ball is turned over, there's often bigger distances between your players, so you have to cover more ground to press the ball. And if there's one thing that set Flicks by and apart, it's how much they ran. Defensively, it was built on intensity. Relentless chasing to win the ball, counter-pressing at every opportunity, and this was highly physically demanding. I wasn't surprised to learn that Flix Bayern made significantly more sprints per game than any of his predecessors. However, achieving this relentless football meant taking a lot of risks. So a very high line, both fullbacks often ahead of the ball, no real dedicated ball winner. So if at any point Bayern started losing those duels, teams did get in behind. As a result, Bayern were quite reliant on the quality of their defenders and goalkeeper to bail them out, the best example being Alfonso Davies, whose ridiculous pace allowed him to recover from his very high starting position. And that was all fine in the league, but against better opposition, the risks did start to show, particularly in the Champions League. At times, Bayern's expansive football made it really hard to counterpress, they were exposed quite frequently, and got away with quite a lot. In the end though, this was a team that was committed to outscoring you and pretty much always did, making them a very entertaining watch. So that's a brief overview of Flicks Bayern Munich, but what about Germany? Well, I've got to say it's very difficult for me to analyse a coach based on an international team. There's so much inconsistency in players, in form, in opponent. There's also much less data available to analyse. However, broadly speaking, Flicks Germany tried to accomplish the same things as his Bayern team. And against weaker nations, that was absolutely enough. It was against the better teams that Germany started to struggle, and without bloating this section too much, there are two main reasons for that which are relevant. The first was player profiles. A lot of the key roles in Flick's Bayern weren't here. They lacked Lewandowski, Muller wasn't quite the player he had been, there was no Thiago, no Alfonso Davies, no Alaba, not even a Pavard and Germany had inferior players in all of those positions, which obviously hurt their ability to just blow teams away like Bayern had. But an even bigger problem was that teams were getting very good at shutting down Flick's system. Two games really came to mind against Japan and also against Hungary. Both teams had different setups, but the key tactical approach was to prevent Germany's pivots from having comfortable possession. Hungary did it with an aggressive man-to-man -man press that mirrored Germany's 3-2-5, and Japan did it with a very compact mid-block that shut down the center of the pitch. And in both games, the German players simply didn't know how to bypass this aggression. The result was a lot of circulation along the back line, but nowhere near the level of line breaking that had been a staple of Flick's Bayern. Germany also, for whatever reason, gradually became a lot more risk averse than Bayern had ever been. There were far fewer long passes, the structure became a bit more rigid with less movement and interchanging, now, I'm not sure exactly why that happened, but I can only assume it was a response to the differences in his squad. He no longer had a hold-up player in Lewandowski, perhaps he wanted to become more controlling to improve the team's counter-press. Regardless, by his last game in charge, Germany looked really sterile and a million years from Flick's Bayern. So we really do have two versions of Hansi Flick here, the one capable of crafting the perfect environment for elite players, and the other who couldn't quite find solutions to some difficult tactical and squad related issues. So given all of that, is he the man for Barcelona specifically? The reality of Hansi Flick is that given a low sample size, we've only seen him succeed with one type of football, the really expansive, very vertical, sprint heavy model. So the question has to be, is that football compatible with the current Barcelona squad? And the answer is no. Barca have had two major issues this season. The first is an inability to put the ball away, and the second is an inability to defend space effectively. And at its best, Flick's model relies on players who can do both of those things. And while I do think Flick could make Barca a potent attacking unit, and an entertaining one, as Xavi has found out, trying to outscore your opponent just doesn't work if you're not clinical. On top of that, 
Barca have a lot of players who get a lot worse the more space they have to cover defensively. Lewandowski, Pedri, Jao Felix, Gundogan, Koundé, Christensen, Cancelo all have struggled to execute Xavi's expansive game model. In fact, we've seen Xavi continually get more conservative in and out of possession to try and stop Barca conceding space, and it hasn't worked. So to appoint a manager whose success has been based on expansive football with lots of verticality, a super high line, seems a little unwise. Now, there are a couple of counter arguments here. The first, of course, is that Barca's squad will change somewhat going into next season. Let's say they do find a ball-winning midfielder, Gabi returns, Alejandro Balde returns, you put more faith in Victor Roque and Firmin, you do have a team there capable of pretty high intensity, and maybe Flick would be the man to put that together. It's also quite appealing to have a manager willing to give his players more positional freedom. I think the likes of Pedri, De Jong, uh, Felix if he's still around, Rafinha would all benefit from that. My concern is just how that would be balanced out of possession, because even at the best of times, Flick's teams have not been good at preventing counterattacks, and that's probably the biggest issue of the current Barcelona. Ultimately, at Bayern, Flick's major success was establishing a simplified message, a clear direction, and it works because Bayern had an exceptional squad of world-class players, most of whom were in their prime. But the circumstances at Barca are so different. It's a very young, imbalanced squad, transfer activity will be limited, and because of that, I think the club needs more of a tactical problem solver. Is Flick that person? Maybe. I can't definitively say no. The issue is we have no evidence of it from his career so far. That's why I personally prefer someone like Julian Nagelsmann. I made a whole video on him that's worth checking out, but in short, he has more evidence of adaptability, his teams generally are more control heavy, and as a coach, he has a real emphasis on counter pressing. And like I said, I think that's the biggest area of concern given Barca's squad. Flick is certainly not a bad coach. Aesthetically, he could make Barca more fun to watch, and it would be nice to see players with more freedom. But do I think he could create a better balance than Xavi already has? Honestly, I'm not so sure. Of course, all of this is my opinion, and a lot depends on what Barca squad looks like next season, so let me know what you think in the comments. If you'd like to support the channel and unlock some bonus content, you can become a member on Patreon. There's a few things that didn't make it into this video, including a section on Thomas Muller, and why players like him are so important to coaches like Flick. But otherwise, thank you so much for watching, and I hope I'll see you again in the next one. Take care.